I would say big picture, there are moments in people's career that you look back on after they become a really, really good player, right? Especially, I think sometimes when a guy's drafted high and it's clear he's kind of snowballing down the hill toward stardom, like a Mahomes or Josh Allen, it's like just an avalanche of building. Like, th- th- I bet if you look back to Mahomes' I mean, it's not his rookie year, but his first year starting. I remember his first game against Chargers. He threw like five touchdowns. It was just like, Jesus Christ, they got something here. Like this, this is on steroids. And it just took off like a rocket ship. I do think sometimes when you're like a random later round pick, moments are bigger to get your respect. Because at the end of the day, like Mahomes or Josh Allen, these are first round picks. Even Lamar, by the time he was second year, like, yeah, he fell in the draft to pick 32. He didn't go pick 150, right? There, there is a level. You saw this forever with Cousins uh, and Dak. I'd even go back. I think the guy that really had to battle it the most, and the stories on him just will not go away, was Russell. And he was a third-round pick, but it was like, what's he really doing? And then he just had moments early on in his career for a really good team. I think there's a chance some of it works actually in the reverse order, Right. That like going to the Super Bowl as a young player means you're probably on a good team, means you probably play for a good coach, and that that experience can give you something that you can build on. It gives you time to develop. It gives you runway. People give you a chance. Um, not all the time, not 100% of the time, but like I would say that to me is what becomes like for Brock. If Brock has a big game against Dallas and they win the game, great. My guess is that Kyle Shanahan won't sit in the press conference after the game and say, Brock just proved something to me. I didn't know about him. Right. He'll be like, yeah, that's Ayuk's not going to be like, Oh my God, I didn't know he had that in him. No, I think they'll say, yeah, that's, that's who he is. Now over time, you win a soup, you win a super bowl this year. Now it gives you the leeway, the runway that the, it, it's such a high pressure position. And in some ways it adds pressure, but in some ways it takes a little off. It just gives you time. And it, and, and it is a reflection of the team you're on with great players and a great coach. So, um, yeah, I don't think he proves anything like in any legacy type way, obviously, on Sunday. And we're not even really that's not what we're talking about. But um, I do think he can. I think part of the question with him right now is toe to toe against Patrick Mahomes. Can he do enough to win the game? Right. And I think that's part of what playing in these types in prime time, there is so much hype on him. There's so much pressure on him. I'm sure he ignores it to a degree, but it's hard to hide from the fact that he's Brock Purdy right now. And that's what's on his shoulders when he takes the field Sunday night. And that's I think if you, <clears throat> Yeah, I think if you just look at this franchise and the players, you know, two guys that went really quick, you know, it's kind of crazy that these two players, I mean, Kaepernick and Montana because by the time Young went 94 the dude had been in the league for a decade right he was on the Bucks forever before he even got to the Niners uh so by the time he became a full-time starting quarterback and Joe was gone and I know he played in some of the years like uh 88 and 89 at different points when if you know Joe got hurt or whatever like he came into the game it's not like he would never play but when he was a full-time starter Montana was drafted in 79 and they won the Super Bowl in 81 and by then, obviously, their team was good. But I, I would say one thing is a good example for him. Now, it's easy to look back. He goes on to just kind of own the 80s. But in 81, the most iconic moment for Joe Montana's career, his career, I would say was not the four, any moment in the four Super Bowls. And I think he had a drive against the Bengals, which is pretty high up there, the John Candy drive. But it has to be the throw against the Cowboys. Right. So his career now – Listen, you and I weren't alive, so it's hard to really quantify as a sports fan, but Montana was much bigger. He's coming from Notre Dame, and Notre Dame, wouldn't you say, in the 70s and 80s, probably the equivalent of like Alabama meets Georgia combined or something, like the fame of a Notre Dame quarterback? Yeah, yeah, I mean. So his fame, now the Niners had been shitty, but they were everyone, the knew who Joe, everyone knew who Joe Montana was, and they became the Niners that moment. Now, at that time, you don't know what it's becoming, but at that time, that moment is one of the biggest moments in the history of the sport, which is, you know, and the NFL, the Mer- it's, it's a shorter lived league, right? It hadn't been going on for 50 years like sure. today, but it's, it's hard. What's crazy about Purdy when you think about it is 
he made some really good plays in the in the wild card playoff game and obviously did enough to win. It was more of a team effort in the second game. But like his season, for as great as his quote unquote rookie year was, starting the however many regular season games and then the three playoff games, is really kind of remembered for getting KO'd in the NFC championship game. I, I would say that's the number when you say Brock Purdy coming into this year, that was the moment him just kind of holding his arm and being, I mean, mm-hmm. no one had ever seen anything like that, that, that I'm not saying that's not his fault or whatever, but that kind of defined Brock Purdy. And then this year it's weird because it was like, I, I think the expectations were like, okay, let's see. And it's like, fuck, you know, and that's where these moments, but, but like I said, with Montana and even Kaepernick, right. What happened with Kaepernick? The, that first year he started like the full-time starter. Once I got rid of Joe, or I guess Alex was technically still on the team that year because he took over and never relented, was him just running on the Packers in the playoffs. It was like, holy shit. So it was like Montana, throw against the Cowboys. Him against the Packers, just running faster than any human we'd ever seen. So I guess my point is, I I, I think it's going to be hard-pressed for Purdy. Like, he's going to get highly judged in the playoffs, especially if he plays these two teams, right, the Cowboys and the Eagles. And that's where he could have a moment that's like, this guy's the full time starter for the next decade. Yeah. Like, obviously, he's much better than Jimmy, but it's like you wouldn't, if I said, hey, bet $10,000, Brock Purdy's the starter for the 49ers for eight years, like, it'd be a pretty risky bet still, right? Yeah, he has a lot to prove. It doesn't mean he just has durability. To pass every There's task. a lot of question marks. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, was it, who said, I heard there was a quote yesterday. Was it like Gerald McCoy? Somebody said, like, tell me when he's done it for two years and then I'll believe it, basically, about Brock. Um, which is actually, I think, just in a vacuum, a very fair statement to make about any quarterback. I think that should be your default about quarterbacks. It's like, let's see. Kaepernick's a great example, right? Like, defenses adjust, you adjust back. Defenses adjust, you adjust back. You get more expensive, your team gets worse, do you get better, right? Like, all these types of things. But when you've played 10 games, you can only prove 10 games worth. When you've played 15 games, you can only prove whatever you can prove through 15 games. So I think for Brock, like what he's trying to prove, and I, let me rephrase that. He is not trying to prove anything. What I still want to see from him before you go, I know definitively he's good enough to win you a Super Bowl. Because I think right now you can put him against any team in any game. And you can win that game. You can beat Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. I don't know how many times do you have to play him 10 times to win five. I don't know. But um, he can win you a Super Bowl. But saying that, can he win you a Super Bowl, doesn't mean can he win you a game. It means can he take you through the playoffs without making mistakes. Big plays, the pressure mounts, the pressure mounts. Because it only gets bigger, which is why this is a great kind of test because it's a big pressure game. Well, to me, it's like the question mark now, big p- b- macro is, does he turn into a more athletic Drew Brees, right? Some version of that, yeah. right? Because he's, he's a pretty unique player. There's not like a comp, right? For like, I'm watching Anthony Richardson. You're like, ah, oh, it's Cam Newton, right? It's like, geez, that's, I know this guy could be a better version of kid. You just watch a movie like, holy think Carolina shit. could not draft him because of that. Even though Cam won him an MVP, took him to the Super Bowl. I saw a tweet that said, I hope everyone realizes the, the Carolina Panthers essentially traded Caleb Williams and uh, DJ Moore for Bryce Young. That's essentially what the trade kind of looks like right now. Oh, yeah. Because because they are, I mean, they're headed toward the number one pick, but the Bears have them. So you think about it, you're like, holy shit. Yeah. And this is why I think Purdy is a great example. And he's playing Dak, who's a great example. And Dak replaced Tony Romo, who's a great example. I'm all for forcing a quarterback, right? If you could like, hey... Team X doesn't need the quarterback. I can trade up and get Caleb Williams. Like, I, I totally understand that. You would do that with Trevor Lawrence. But I would say the rest of the guys, and even Caleb, you know, he, he is, as I was told by I, some people, like, he's 6'2". I've been told he's 6006, which means basically six feet and a half, which on NFL standards is short. So that's that to me would be the knock on. He's thick, physical characteristics, no question. He is shorter. He's on the shorter end. Now, Steve Young is, isn't that tall. Like, I'm not saying that he's not Bryce. I mean, Bryce is a midget for NFL. Bryce fans. I mean, 5'9", 185. Caleb, I guess, 215. I mean, he's, he looks thick. Yeah. But my point is, the 49ers are a good example. Forced a quarterback. It just blew up in their face. So many teams, the Bears trade up. And hell, 
sometimes when you force a quarterback, and I don't blame these teams for doing it, the Russell Wilson move, like they regret that, right? The Broncos and Seattle. That is like, how many times do you think John and Pete go? Can you believe how lucky we got making that trade? How much happened? And the Roger, John- Rogers trade's a good example. A no brainer trade. He's also tradable because would the Packers trade him if he was 31? Of course not. He's 39. You're like, fuck it. Rips his Achilles. Yeah. Old players get hurt sometimes. So is it really that crazy that he's hurt? Not really. Right. Again, I'm not trying to play Monday morning quarterback, but my point is that sometimes you just draft a guy. The Raiders are a good example. They got a nine, nine years worth of starts out of a guy. They just drafted in the second round. Derek Carr didn't force anything. Took Khalil Mack high. Right. Jimmy Garoppolo went on to have a long career. Where'd Belichick draft him? Like 20 picks after Derek. You just just taking it where it comes to me. That I mean, how will much? Levis can't beat out Malik Willis. So I'm not you're not guaranteed just because you pick a guy in the second round. But my point is. Russell Wilson, Kirk Cousins. Sometimes you just let a guy fall to you. How many spots did the, tree, the Chiefs move up to draft Mahomes? Uh, well, they would have been in the 20s. So, like, yeah. So they, they went um, up. I guess they didn't 12. go up to one to draft their quarterback. They went up to the, you know, whatever he was, 12, 12. Or 13. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's not letting it come to you, but it's also not. Now, they also weren't really desperate. They were desperate because they believed in the guy not because they were failing as a team, right? They had Alex Smith. They could, if you said five more years, Alex, okay, that'd be okay. Wouldn't be great. But I would say though, like they're a great example. They all came to the conclusion. We think this guy is like, can't miss. Yeah. You know, I think their conviction on him with Andy, with Feech, with John Dorsey, the multiple years of scouting. I, I, I think Brett Veach, multiple live appearances, for example, the Niners, when they made their trade, blows them out of the water. It wasn't like, you know, we like these two guys. We kind of got to convince our coach. It was like, we're fucking in love with this guy. We've been telling his agent for six months. Let's rig this thing. <laughs> I mean, it was, that's the type of love where it's like, I proposed to her after three months. I knew she was going to be my wife forever. And then 50 years later, you know, they die holding hands. It was like, you just knew, love at first sight. The 49ers are a good example. They, they found... They've lucked into their two starting quarterbacks. Belichick calls Kyle out of the blue. The 49ers did not initiate that with Jimmy Garoppolo. Right? That's not breaking news. Belichick just randomly calls him in the morning. They didn't even think he was available. Right? And then and he and he said, What? Like, you got two hours, call me back. And and this one just I don't want to say fell in their lap because they did like him. So you get credit for liking a guy and picking him, just like the Patriots 199, Tom Brady. But like they there's elements of luck like fuck what if mcdaniel would have taken him instead of skylar thompson which i i would imagine they had it, it probably instead of being purdy skylar it was skylar purdy which might have come down to like yeah just stack it that way you could argue they have all the the best quarterbacks in 49ers history are all players that they kind of when I say lucked into, in this case, it means like it, just lucky no one else drafted Joe Montana before pick 82. Steve Young was in an awful situation in Tampa, right? Like, that's not a normal way to get a quarterback, and they eventually acquire him. Jeff Garcia was in the CFL, and I had forgotten until I looked back the other day. I looked back earlier this week because Brock broke Jeff's record, and he's on pace. No, he's on pace to break Jeff's single season passing record for the Niners. Jeff Garcia signs with the Niners. Steve Young gets his concussions. Garcia plays out that year, like 99 splitting some snaps with Steve Stenstrom. The Niners then draft, not one, but two quarterbacks in the next draft. And Jeff Garcia beats them both out. (laughs) They didn't want Jeff Garcia to be their quarterback. He's at this point, what the third best quarterback in franchise history. Kaepernick was a second rounder. Jimmy, you just illustrated. Garcia, Garcia went to four Pro Bowls back when, like, if you were a Pro Bowl, you were one of the three best, you know, quarterbacks in your conference, right? I looked one year, John, he was 63% completion, third best in the NFL. It was, it, it was much harder. It was Kurt Warner best. was like 68, and then everybody else was like 64% or worse, you know? Yeah, you got killed. Yeah, so, but, but like. You know what the, Young, what you, know the, Steve, you know what Steve Young was traded for? How about, how about the Cowboys? <laughs> Who? You mentioned Dak, but also Romo, right? For sure. Aikman was a highly drafted player. Yeah. They got Steve Young for a fourth round pick. Fourth round. Steve, pick. Young, Steve Young and Trey Lance went for the same compensation. So it's just like there's nothing wrong. 
I would say any element of in your life, there, there's got to be some so, luck involved. Now, once you get lucky, one thing I, I can't get over whenever I see Purdy conduct himself or kind of he, he's just very serious. And, and I think the overachievers, because I think that's where he's ultimately going to fall, even though clearly like he's talented enough to make the league. He was talented enough to dominate in the power five. He was talented enough to, uh, you know, he should have been drafted higher. I, I saw, was it Peter King or someone said that if you could redo the draft, that Purdy would go, I guess Purdy wasn't in Trevor Lawrence's draft, but he said Purdy would go ahead of Trevor Lawrence. They, they, they got the drafts mixed up, but that's not true. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> but if you read it a draft, like Purdy is not going, I mean, he's going in the first round. So just because of the position he plays, even with the question marks, like, is it sustainable? So I, 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 you know, it's just, it's just a wild story. But I, well, I, I think, I, I, I do think there's similarities when you watch like Drew Brees. I'll never forget uh, the offensive lineman that retired and then became their play-by-play guy, and then he like then he left that and got back into coaching. I forget, I forget his name, but he when he gave his retirement speech, he started crying over Drew Brees, like how much he inspired him, like how how serious these guys are with football. And we always talk, right? Peyton and Tom. It, honestly, it was like. Peyton was first known for it. And then Tom became his equal, not accomplishments, just pr- preparation. And then by the end of the decade, you know, the Drew Breeses and, and I think the young guys, like I think people view Mahomes as a guy that takes football fucking very seriously. And I know he trains really hard clearly to play for Kyle. Like that's kind of a, they were stuck with Jimmy, but I, I not that Jimmy didn't grind, but they like wanted it up a level. And I think that Purdy is that like, I would imagine if you got his iPad, uh, Right, like uh, how many hours a week or whatever? It's probably pretty screen high. Screen time. You, didn't get it, a lot of you mentioned something with uh, like a couple weeks ago. Dion has a highly uh, highly touted corner or something that they're not playing. I think like, he finally played the other day and had like seven PBUs. And I I, I ended up after you told me that somehow the clip Carmani like, McLean. Yeah, like he was asked about it, right? And, mm-hmm. and Dion, I always listen, Dion. He's a very old school dude. And I, I do, they are not, I've had scouts tell me they do not fuck around with football stuff. And one of the things Dion mentioned about him specifically was like on Thursday, he gets the printout, right? For every guy on the team, their iPad usage. And, you know, one thing about Dion, this ain't, he not worried about calling guys out transferring, right? Because he specifically called this guy out like, it ain't enough. People right? who don't and, understand, this is the number one corner in the class. <laughs> And was not playing on a terrible defense because Dion and the coaching staff thought clearly he's I mean, he's an 18 year old probably doesn't even realize like bro just let me fucking go man to man <laughs> right that's what you would have said Dion but Dion would have said yeah I had your skills and better and I studied right and, and this gets back to Kyle because I was thinking about like culture in football you know think about the the dynasty of the Patriots that but the last iteration just how obviously Tom set the tone. But then Gronk, Edelman, some of their offensive linemen, Hightower, McCordy, Slater on special teams. You can, to me, culture, obviously the coach matters and implements the scheme and everything, but it's really your tone is set from the players. Yeah. And I, I think that's what the 49ers have in spades. But you have to have, you can have the culture and the character of the guys. But if you're missing the quarterback, I don't care if you got seven Debo's and four Trent Williams, you're going to have limitations and you're going to get bounced probably when you shouldn't. And now that they have it, who fits in their mold, it's like the sky's the limit. Why did the Eagles really take off and feel even higher level than the Carson Wentz foals? Because this guy is so fucking serious, right? He's just. Even when he plays shitty, I I have so much respect for Jalen Hurts because I just know, like, I bet Kyle would like him. Just not, I'm not saying his limitations sometimes as a player, but just how seriously he takes football. Well, you know, I thought of Jalen this week when you sent me yesterday the clip of um, Jimmy Ward on the Richard Sherman podcast saying, like, ah, I think Jimmy Garoppolo could have played in the NFC Championship game. And I just immediately thought of the way that Jalen Hurts handled the national championship when he was at Alabama and he got benched at halftime and they brought in Tua and Tua brought him back and they won the title. Different situation. Jimmy had been going through getting marginalized by Kyle for like three years. He was over it. But 
Did you, you know, see the that, part of the clip where Jimmy said, after he said, I only want to play nickel or I want to play safety, not nickel. Kyle said no. And he said, we never talked again the rest of the year. <laughs> I did not. See they didn't that speak. Part of the clip, they no. didn't. The, him and Kyle did not speak. I saw that he said to Miko told him, uh, wherever I go, you can come play safety for me if I get a head coaching job. But yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for. He's got, in fairness to Jimmy, these conversations are tough, right? He's got pride. He's been a starter on a Super Bowl team. And he got he got beat out by the Niners, right? Like they had they Kyle thought Jimmy they had Ward. Been. Yeah. Jimmy Ward. Yeah. Yeah. I just I go back to when he got hurt and Brock said, Now is a chance for me to prove that I'm what I say I am. That's a pretty impressive way for somebody to look at a a bit of adversity. Like I preach that I handle this stuff, so let's see if I handle it. Um and you know, I think sometimes athletes and teams and coaches they get I think one of the things that pisses them off is when people assume from the outside, like (laughs) we're putting pressure on you. I expect you to win. And from their perspective, they think I'm the one putting in the work. You don't have a higher standard for me than I have for myself. Right. Like, I think that's what pisses, pisses guys off. And you're like, yeah, if a team is losing, yeah, we're losing, but believe me, whatever you think I should be doing, I think even more highly of me. And I think that's what kind of Brock was saying when he said, let's see if I am what I say I am. Like at a time when nobody had really that high of a standard for him as a player, he had a high standard. Now the standard has raised for him and he doesn't seem to have changed his standard for himself. Like this has always been a standard. Um, A buddy of mine called me yesterday. He's like, you know, the thing about Brock as I watch him is just that nothing ever changes for him. And that's what this is like. He's going through this period now. Things change for guys who become stars, who start getting endorsement deals. Like I saw Brock did the clip like, oh, I'm sharing a room and I'm driving a, my Toyota, my Toyota Tundra. It's like, well, yeah, but that's a Toyota Tundra commercial now that you're in. Right. Like his life is changing around him every week. It's still early. Nothing seems to be changing. And that's where, you know, Randy Gregory got cut. And I did a video yesterday like maybe they'll sign him. Maybe they won't. But I read a text message from somebody who was with the Broncos during camp. And he said, yeah, the problem with Randy Gregory and Sean Payton is Sean puts a lot of emphasis on effort. I'm like, oh, seems like a high bar. (laughs) So could the Niners handle Randy Gregory? Sure. I mean, he wouldn't, whatever. He wouldn't distract them. Could Chris Kassara coach him up? Yeah. Hell yeah. Does he fit in with them? No. No, he doesn't fit in with them. Yeah. This why this is why during the scouting process, and I, I always think it's just it, it always has irked me sometimes. Like when things are asked to players or things get out during the the process before a guy's drafted, and you know a lot of media members go, "This is so unfair. Why do we care about a guy having balance? And why do we care about their family structure?" Like this is the business you're in, finding everything out about this human being. This, the human is your business. And when you're going to draft a guy high, you need to know everything about him. You do, If the player instead, this was private equity and was an insurance company, you would dive into every element of that business, right? But there'd be no emotion. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. But everyone gets so emotional during draft time. And sometimes it's like, does it matter that Des Bryant's mom was a prostitute? Like, yeah, I mean, I understand. Like, But like those, those are questions like you're just... You, if you don't think in a meeting you're talking about, hey, we're my draft this guy in the top 20, talking about his mom being a prostitute, like it just about his background, who's coming with him. But to quarterbacks, your family structure is so important. And I think when you look at a lot of the quarterbacks in the NFL right now, right, like how you were raised equates to how you're going to handle this. I, I think Steph and Clay are good examples, right? They were raised rich kids. Their kids, you know, they were NBA sons. <laughs> But clearly they were raised pretty well, right? Like take things very seriously, but also have this, you know, like this great balance. Mahomes, dad was in the big leagues, kind of just handles it pretty smoothly. Now, most people like Tom Brady's dad was just, you know, an upper middle class dude in San Francisco. Peyton Manning's dad was an NFL and college football legend. So it was different. But clearly both of them were just kind of built to handle it. And you see it right away. Jalen Hurts. What ha- his dad's a high school football coach. Kellen Moore never made it, but why he'll probably be a successful coach. Dad's a coach. Like they're just wired. Like the wiring of you is set from your youth. And then by the time you get to college, 
you are you have that mold and then get influenced by whoever you're playing for or whatever. But to me, Purdy is a good example. Jared Goff, that like clearly they were raised well. Now part of it is like the genetics you have and your disposition and stuff. But like you, you kind of get that molded over time, and it either works or it doesn't. And some guys, I have a lot of respect for all these, you know, like Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. Can you imagine being like 27, 28, making 45, 50 million dollars a year? And clearly, like you just watch Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson, they look like they're making a fucking a million dollars, right? I mean, how hard they're playing, how good they look. It's just like it, 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 it that's listen, pro athletes have always made a lot of money. You start getting. 40 50 million dollars a year like jamie diamond ceo of chase doesn't you know i mean this is to to keep your focus like that's really impressive i I don't care who you are and maybe it's the nature of football you're getting yelled at it's intense that's the other thing right if you don't prepare you'll get embarrassed this isn't it's not like james harden could just show up score 30 whatever it's a baseball you can you can sleepwalk through a season and If, if josh allen just they were playing someone good right let's just this week they're playing the jacks he didn't watch an ounce of film didn't try at practice like he could just throw like three picks and get clowned right yeah <laughs> you know well, like, he would it, it would happen eventually yeah he could maybe especially get when he, for a week but yeah maybe yeah maybe you, you can't you Probably can't not. avoid it that much it's why all these guys like after the fact say i wish i would have treated it like this now brock purdy didn't have a choice right as a, as p- the last pick to get in this position, he had to impress at every moment he was in the building, every moment he was at practice. But then what's great about that, when you're a quote unquote overachiever or whatever, Tom was obviously the best version of this. You never lose that. That's what made Peyton so unique, right? Number one elite prospect who had that work ethic, desire, drive. It's like, holy shit. <laughs> you know, right? I think people, the knock would be on Favre. It's like, God, if he would have had that, he might have won like six MVPs. Right. Right. So that's what Kyle's like had wet dreams forever about finding that type player. It's who he loves. That's why I think Matt Ryan is a good example of the most accomplished quarterback he ever had because he was the most talented and he won the MVP. And now you look at this, you know, I think the sky's the limit because this guy checks every box. Really, the only knock is short. Well, yeah, not every box. right? No, but I'm saying like every box of into off the field stuff. Yeah, he's missing some tangible stuff. But we've seen I, I, that's why I think Drew Brees is his comp weaker arm, but Purdy can move. Brees couldn't. But I, I, wouldn't you say that Brees and Purdy have a lot of similar like it, just clearly the intangible stuff and how much the teammates respect them from every walk of life, whether you're from the SEC like Debo, whether you're a kid, whoever you are, he everyone gravitates toward him. They're, they're similar. Fairness, I'm not the biggest Dak guy, but I, Dak does have that as well. Right? Yeah. No, I mean, they're, and they're similar, right? Like Breeze played at a, he played at freaking Purdue. Now he got drafted in the second round, not the seventh Iowa State. But you know, Drew was not immediately handed an NFL job, right? He was behind a guy, then got repl- then actually was playing well, got replaced by a guy, got sent off to another team, had an injury. One team didn't want him because of the shoulder. He goes to New Orleans. Like it wasn't an easy road for him. I, I think I think Flutie started early on when he was in San Diego. Oh, you know, like Flutie was. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I don't think he played a lot. year. I need to look at the stats. I don't think he played a lot year one. Well, Kyle was asked about like, is he a product of your system? And he called it ridiculous. He's like, go watch the tape. So it's on tape. You can't do all the stuff. He's he's been out there too long. It's on tape. So uh, well, when you, you say football and we're going to talk about this till it's going to be a conversation that's not going to leave Purdy until he like wins a Super Bowl. And even then people will be like, well, he's just a product. The team was great. <laughs> you know, this Ultimately, like Drew Brees is a great example, I think. They built the system around him. Sean Payton, offensive coach the entire time. The ent- he was a play caller the whole time. Like, was he a product? Who cares? It Football is the one sport where it doesn't matter, right? Like, you are a product. Like, obviously, Mahomes has benefited from being around Andy. Yeah, you could argue every quarterback is, is a system quarterback to a point because they all play in a system. 